Hello everyone, hi. I just wanna thank all of my subscribers and just people that um, been following my channel. I know I haven't been on a lot like I was because I have a lot of other things going on, but I just wanted to come on and share a word with you. Um, guard your heart, the liturgies of home. And um, I'm talking about James K. A. Smith, You Are What You Love, The Spiritual Power of Habit. And I talked about this before. Um, and so I just want to share something out of this book with you. And it says right here, we love because he first loved us. First John 4, 19. This truth is the nourishing conviction of what I've been describing, the model of human beings as lovers and the vision for discipleship that grows out of it. The divine initiative of love for us, even while we were enemies, Romans 5, 8 through 10, is the first grace that both makes possible and provokes our love. And note that John's remarkable, beautiful claim is not just that the we love God because he first loved us, but that we love because he first loved us. Even our disordered loves bear a backhanded witness to the fact that we are made in God's image. Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar captures this in an image that is both beautiful and biblical, a metaphor that is natural and supernatural at the same time. After a mother has smiled at her child for many days and weeks, he notes she finally receives her child's smile in response. She has awakened love in the heart of her child, and as the child awakens to love, it also awakens to knowledge. It's like we love in order to know, but we are loved into loving. Noting the priority of the mother's initiative, Balthasar continues, knowledge comes into play because the play of love had already begun beforehand, initiated by the mother, the transcendent. There is a natural but iconic picture here of a reality that is trans ascendant and eternal. And let me just show that, share this with you. God interprets himself to man as love in the same way. He radiates love, which kindles the light of love in the heart of man. And it is pr precisely the light that allows man to perceive this, the absolute love, for it is the God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, who has shone in our heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. In this face, the primal foundation of being smiles at us as a mother and as a father. Insofar as we are his creatures, the seed of love lies dormant within us as the image of God. But just as no child can be awakened to love without being loved, so to no human heart, can come to an understanding of God without the free gift of his grace in the image of his son. The smile of the cherishing mother that evokes the smile of the infant is a microsm of a cosmic truth, the God's gracious initiative in the incarnation. He first loved us. is the provoking smile of a creator who meets us in the flesh, granting even the grace that allows us to love him in return. The picture is powerful because it is so tangible and embodied. You can picture the chubby cheeks, smell that one of a kind new baby scent, hear the tick, tick, tick soundtrack of a suckling child, and then watch the serene smile of wonder and love that washes over a mother's face. That smile, Balthasar suggests, it, it's own kind of sacrament a means of grace, a conduit of love. The creator of the universe meets us in the same way, unfolding unto his care by meeting us in the sun become flesh. Jesus is the smile of God. That incarnational impulse to provoke our responses is continued in his body in the tangible ways he nurses and, and nourishes our faith, giving us bread, wine, and water along the way. But the metaphor is suggestive in another way. It is a reminder 
of the ways that love is incubated in the home, that the household is also a deeply formative of deformative space that teaches us how to love from infancy. We love because he first loved us, but we learn how to love at home. This is part of an important reality that needs to be realized and named. Obviously, in an hour and a half on Sunday morning is not sufficient to rehabilitate rehab hearts that are daily immersed in rival liturgies. Yes, gather congregational worship is the heart of discipleship. But this doesn't mean that communal worship is the entirety of discipleship. While communal worship is the entirety, excuse me, while communal worship calibrates the heart in necessary fundamental ways, we need to take the opportunity to cultivate kingdom-oriented liturgies throughout the week. The capital L, Liturgy of Sunday morning, should generate lowercase liturgies that govern our, our existence throughout the rest of the week. Our discipleship practices from Monday through Saturday shouldn't simply focus on Bible knowledge acquisitions. We aren't, after all, liturgical animals on Sunday and thinking things for the rest of the week. Rather, our day-to-day -day practices need to extend and amplify the formative power of our weekly worship practices by weaving them into our everyday liturgies. There are all kinds of other spaces where we can and should be intentional about the liturgies that govern our, our rhythms, and we should see this as an opportunity to extend the formative practices of worship into other sectors of our life. Recognizing worship as the heart of discipleship doesn't mean sequestering discipleship to Sunday. It means expanding worship to become a way of life. So if we need to intentionally, so if we need to be intentional about the liturgies of Christmas, Christ, excuse me, Christian worship in the congregation, we should be equally intentional about the liturgies of the household. More specifically, we should be attentive to the families, excuse me, more specifically, we should be attentive to the rhythms and rituals that constitute the background hum of our families and should consider the telos towards which these activities are oriented. The frenetic pace of our lives means we often end up falling into routines without much reflection. We do what we think good parents do. And we might think these are just things that we do without recognizing that they may also be doing something to us. You know, in this book, this chapter is an invitation to take a kind of liturgical audit of our households, recognizing their power to calibrate our hearts and acknowledging that our domestic rituals might need to be recalibrated as a result of our auditing work. However, we should also consider how the liturgies of the household grow out of and draw us into the liturgies of the congregation. No home or family can be can its own church. No home or family can be its own church. No household is a substitute for the household of God, Ephesians 2:19. We all need to locate our households in the household of God and to situate our families within the first family of the church. To do this, we first need to see the ways that the church's worship teaches us how to be families and households. Then we need to consider how our households, lowercase l, liturgies, can be nourished by and can propel us back into the capital liturgy of the body of Christ. And I just wanted to share that with you. Liturgies. Liturgy with the big L. And liturgy with a little l. How can we be taken back to the body of Christ? Not just in church, but in our households also. Thanks for joining. Have a nice day.